right, so we'll jump right into this. Hello, everyone. This is another episode of Fire Breathing Rob. Please like and subscribe to our YouTube page. And also, if you're listening to us on the uh, 10 radio stations, thanks so much for that. We really appreciate that. And if you look at the videos, please share them as we do our interviews with amazing people that do amazing things all over the country. Today, we just did Teddy Dupay, a former Gator. Before this, now we're going to hop right into the Providence College Friars, where I'm originally from in Rhode Island. And this guy is a coach at PC, all right, Bob Walsh. And he also was a great coach at, the, uh, at Rick, a Rhode Island college. And I, you know, through going to school at LaSalle Academy and being around the area, I saw how good Rick was when you coached them. And I really enjoyed that. And I'd love to learn more about you. So, Mr. Walsh, thanks so, com thanks so much for coming on the program. We greatly appreciate it. I appreciate it. Rob, thanks for having me. All right, so Mr. Walsh, can you tell the viewers where you first got your love for basketball? <laughs> sure. Call me Bob, please, because when All you right. say Mr. Walsh, I'm looking for my dad over my shoulder. But, uh, yeah, I grew up uh, in New York, just outside of the city, and played sports all my life. So I was just a, you know, your typical, you know, young, athletic gym rat type and played basketball, played baseball, played soccer, played football, and, uh, you know, New York City at the time was a big high school basketball hotbed and, you know, basketball was a big deal and I just loved it ever since uh, I was a kid. But where did you get that mindset and say, hey, after I'm done playing, I really want to go into basketball coaching wise? I kind of knew I wanted to be in athletics when I was in high school. You know, everybody in my family, my mother, my father, my brother, were all business school, uh, CPAs, certified public accountants, you know, in the business world. And I actually commuted into New York City for high school uh, from outside the city. And I was on the train in the morning with businessmen and, bus you know, women in business uh, going to their offices, wearing their suits. And I knew I didn't want to do that. I wanted to be involved in athletics somehow. And I also knew I wasn't going to be good enough to play. And, uh, you know, I, 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 you know, played for a couple of years in college and that was my goal, but I, I knew I was never going to get paid to play a sport. So I, I kind of took a natural, uh, liking to leadership positions on team that's teams that I was on. I was always kind of a guy who wasn't afraid to speak up and get things organized and, uh, you know, the Yankees signed a shortstop in, in the mid-90s, Derek Jeter, so I knew I wasn't going to play shortstop for them. So uh, that kind of led me into the coaching arena. I, I remember going to Rick, and uh, there was a guy from East Providence. I went to basketball camps at Rick, uh, Alex Butler, uh, if you remember him, uh, and going to all those camps at yep. Rick. Uh, you know, you did such a great job at Rick. It's a Division three school. Your record was 204 and 63. Eight NCAA tournament appearances and an Elite Eight appearance. Can you talk about that career, at Rick? And how did you build such a good a team at a, such a small school, such as Rhode Island College? Alex Butler's a 2,000 point scorer at Rick, actually, one of the all time greats. So, and a great high school coach uh, in his own right at East Providence. But nice. uh, yeah, the Rick experience was unbelievable for me. I was an assistant at Providence College. Uh, I didn't feel like I was getting necessarily better as a coach as much as I would like to year after year. I had spent seven great years there as an assistant with Tim Welsh and had a ton of responsibility. But the opportunity right down the road, I mean, you, you know, Rhode Island College and Providence College are about a mile and a half from each other. And um, so the opportunity to, became a head, to become a head coach, I thought, would make me a lot better. And, um, you know, it was right in the area. I didn't realize we could be that good that quickly. You know, I certainly got a little bit lucky. The team that I took over uh, that first year was a veteran team that was really talented uh, and had a lot of freshmen and juniors on it. So we kind of had two years with the group together. Uh, and then, you know, I spent the first year trying to figure it out and making all sorts of mistakes. And I think we won 19 games. But then the following year, we had a veteran group had been together for a couple of years and we went to the elite eight that year and went 27 and four and won the first championship in, in school history. So, you know, really the success was, was attributed to two things. We had really tough, talented players and I was lucky to inherit those guys and then be able to recruit them. Uh, and we got them to buy into something that I think was a little bit uncommon. And that was an approach that really fit, uh, their personalities, it fit the culture of the school, 
uh, and that approach allowed us to sustain success at a high level. Uh, we ended up having a terrific run, like you said, eight straight years in the NCAA tournament. Right. So then you went to Maine and, you know, you had some good times and bad times. Can you talk about that experience going from, you know, how, how, how different was it to recruit from Division three to Division one? <laughs> it's not as different as you would think. And I think yeah. that that uh, idea that it's, you know, it's almost like people look at Division three like you're coaching a different sport. Uh, obviously, the main difference is you're not giving out scholarships at the Division three level. Uh, there's challenges to that, but there's also value to that and that, you know, those kids are there because they want to be there. Uh, one of the great things about the kids we had at Rhode Island College was uh, they needed basketball. They needed our program. You know, the, it's a, a first generation, a lot of them college students. It's an affordable state school, as you know. So uh, it's a little different at the Division One level when you're offering scholarships. I always joked, you know, when I, when I left Rick and took the main job, you know, the difference was – at Maine, we had scholarships. At Rick, we had better players, you know. And, and I, I promise you, our, my last team at Rick would have beat my first team at Maine by 15 points. Um, so the talent that we had, it really wasn't much difference. You know, we beat, we beat two Division I teams while I was at Rhode Island College. We beat Holy Cross. We beat Iona. So, um, you know, the, the, the experience at Maine was terrific for me. Uh, even though we didn't have the success that we wanted, you know, we did two things that I, I think are really important. One, we changed the entire culture. Uh, and the biggest difference when I took over at Maine was uh, I took over the worst team in the league and, and a culture that was used to losing. Uh, that was challenging because, uh, you know, getting the buy-in and the belief takes a lot longer if you're not having success. And, and the second thing was, you know, we did the right thing by our players. You know, we were able to change the culture into a positive one, even though we didn't win as many games as we would have liked. But also, you know, we did right by the players that we recruited. And we ended up with, I believe it was nine players who ended up transferring to higher level schools and ended up going from Maine to VCU to uh, Oklahoma to South Carolina to Colorado State to St. Joe's. Uh, that's nine guys who all at one point would have played on the same team at Maine, but because the support at Maine was different, uh, you know, the school has always struggled financially. You know, we brought in a great group of talented young men our first two years and had a chance to go on, you know, we think to be a force in that league. Uh, but when they had opportunities to go elsewhere, I couldn't look them in the eye and say, no, the experience for you is going to be better here at the University of Maine. And they had opportunities to go to great places. And, um, you know, unfortunately, it, it, we suffered as far as wins and losses at Maine. But, again, we built a great culture and we did the right thing by the players. And the experience at Maine made me a much better coach. So, uh, you know, I have a lot of uh, great relationships from those four years. And I know I got a lot better as a coach. And that was really important. Bob Walsh here on Fire Breathing Rob. Uh, Bob, can you talk about this? You coached with Tim Welsh, and I met Tim a couple of times when he was recruiting uh, Jermaine Peterson. He had a tournament with Michael Beasley at the time at, uh, it was at LaSalle Academy. I went and go and watch. Uh, and Tim seemed like a nice guy. You also are coaching with Ed Cooley, who's, you know, the pride of Providence. He's from Providence, Rhode Island. What are the, the similarities and differences with, you know, being with those two, you know, guys that have been in Pro at Providence? But Tim was at in Providence for quite a long time, and I'm sure Ed's going to be there for quite a long time also. So what are the similarities and differences with them? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Uh, you know, Tim was there for 10 years. I was with him for his first seven at Providence. Um, and Ed's been now there 10 years, I believe, as well. So uh, both of them have uh, – one of the positive aspects for both of them is great personalities. Uh, you know, relating to the players was uh, really, is, is really impactful. And that's one of the things I learned from both of them is uh, your connection to the players is really, really important. And, uh, you know, with Tim, he was, he really taught me the value of what you do every day right? The way you approach every day and all the stuff that we do is for those 30 nights that we get, right? So everything we're doing is building towards that. Uh, I think 
both of them were great, are great offensive minds. Uh, Ed Cooley has two things. One, his personality is about as strong of a force as you'll ever see, and it's authentic and genuine, right? So as far as relationships, as far as caring about the people around him, uh, creating that bond that allows you to get the most out of your team, I've never seen anybody quite like Coach Cooley. Uh, the second thing is the way his mind works offensively. And, and Tim was the same way. Uh, they see the game offensively really quickly and really clearly and can make adjustments. And, and it's been a great learning experience for me with Coach Cooley because he will literally see something happen on offense in the first half and say, you know, after a timeout in the second half, we're going to run this option off of that and we're going to get the slip to the hoop because they're going to double David when he comes off the screen. Uh, and technically he operates in a way that's really fascinating and, and puts the, the kids, uh, you know, in a great position to be successful. So, so both guys really, really good with relationships, offensive minds, terrific. Um, I would say Ed's personality is a little bit stronger than Tim's, even though Tim's w was very strong. Um, both guys have a way of just getting guys to come out of the locker room ready to want, run through a wall, you know, and, and that's, you know, that night, 7 o'clock tip, being ready to go. I, I would say that, uh, you know, both guys find a way to get their teams ready to fight, ready to play, ready to scrap. And, and that's, a, you know, another similarity between the two. Agreed. And you look at with uh, Tim Welsh, with the Mashan Brooks, he came in there and he looked not like a great player. And then all of a sudden he gets the NBA getting drafted by the Celtics. And I mean, all the players that Ed's, uh, you know, developed so good. I mean, Bryce Cotton was, is, you know, an amazing player at Providence. You know, winning that Big East tournament was one of my highlights as being a Friar fan. I believe it was in 2014. But yep. I want to get into this. Uh, and this is Bob Walsh here on Fire Breathing Rob. Uh, Coach Walsh, we looked at last year, and there were some good stretches, and there were some tough stretches at the beginning of the year. But the Friars really finished out the year, like, on fire, to be honest with you. Going into the Big East tournament, it looked like they could make a charge to win the Big East tournament. And then the coronavirus happened. You know, do you have any thoughts on how the season ended? Obviously, you know, the coronavirus, it is what it is. But, you know, how the season ended, how the Friars were really kicking it to, into gear at the end. Obviously disappointing, like it is for everybody. But it's amazing how quickly it all happened. And it went from, like, what do you mean we're not going to play in front of fans to, you know, wow, this is a worldwide pandemic that's, you know, impacting hundreds of thousands of people in a serious way. So it's hard to sit there and feel disappointed about not getting to play a basketball game, uh, yeah. you know, with what we're going through. But you put it in a vacuum, right, and we're sitting there, uh, you know, middle of February, I think Valentine's Day, we were 500 in the Big East. We had lost to St. John's. We weren't playing well. We had a really tough stretch coming up, Seton Hall at home, and, um, you know, we had two really good days of practice. Our fans were unbelievable. I remember that day we played Seton Hall. We came out like 29 to 6 on them and really didn't look back from there. So we, we were playing really, really well the last three weeks. Uh, you know, it's great to dream about what could have happened. We certainly – we felt good about our, uh, our spot in the Big East tournament. You know, we were going to play Butler that Thursday. Uh, you know, we had Creighton, who uh, should they win, which, you know, we thought they would as the top seed. But we felt like Creighton was a good matchup for us. We'd beaten them at home and really uh, blew a five-point lead with a minute and a half to go against Creighton on the road. So you, you kind of looked at stuff like, wow, we're right where we want to be. You know, we're playing well. Our seniors had all sort of said, you know, this isn't – like we're not going out like this, so to speak, in mid-February. Uh, you know, we could have gone on a long run, but there's a lot of teams that could have. You're also one loss away from everything changing, you know. So uh, it was a great way to finish. It was tough not to finish it out, but I'm certainly glad we were playing really well down the stretch when it did end because it allows you to feel a lot better for the seniors. Guys like Alpha Diallo, Luan Pipkins, who, yeah. you know, the challenge was, can you guys lead a team to the NCAA tournament? And the answer was yes, and that's, that's good to know. 
Uh, Bob, can we talk about this? Uh, how has it been as far as recruiting wise going with, you know, you can't go out and visit families. It's basically social media and talking on the phone, I guess, you know, you can correct me if I'm wrong. How is that going to be for, you know, God knows how long this is going to go on for, you know, no one knows uh, how long. So how's that going to affect the team next year? Yeah, it's different. It's certainly different. You know, we're all doing Zoom calls and, and our visits are virtual and, you know, schools have set up and, and our, you know, we have uh, marketing, social media, uh, video people that are terrific and you set up a virtual visit to Providence College uh, with the family and with the recruit, you know, with the coaching staff and yet, yet answer questions and you take them through what they want to know. The hard part is they don't get to come to campus and they don't get to know your players very well. Um, so the, the challenge is, look, we, we, we did a good job recruiting in the spring and we were in good shape. And I, I think what you're going to see when this thing does end and we start to get back to normal, the programs that were on a good foundation as far as culture, as far as recruiting, uh, as far as success and with, you know, the success Coach Cooley has had, I mean, this would have been the sixth time in seven years that Providence was going to the NCAA tournament. We won, you know, 12 league games this year for the first time ever. There's a foundation there with how they've recruited the relationships that they've had even before I got here with Coach Battle, Coach Thomas, Coach Blaney. Uh, that's, we're in good shape uh, and everybody's in the same boat, right? It's not like Kentucky and, you know, Georgetown are having kids on campus and we're not. So you do it virtually. Some families are really into it and interested and think, wow, that's a place that fits me. Some other families are saying, well, we really can't make any decisions right now. Uh, so, you know, we've got 12 of our 13 scholarships full for next year. So we're not sure if we would even use the 13th one uh, in, unless we found, you know, the perfect fit at the right position. So, uh, but moving forward, if, you know, we're not watching kids. The other part of it is we're not watching kids play live, right? We're not going out and recruiting, you know, in June and July as of right now. So uh, you, there's going to be a bit of a restart when it all comes, starts to get back to normal and we're all going to have to adjust. Uh, Bob, can we talk with two questions left? Uh, what is a typical day for an assistant coach at Providence College? Can you tell the viewers that? Yeah, absolutely. I love the question. So <laughs> I would say there's a difference between – uh, in season and out of season, you know, uh, during the season, you, you've always got games to prepare for, right? So, uh, and, and Coach Cooley's the best, right? He's not one of those, I mean, literally the best guy to work for. He's not one of those guys that's like checking to see what time you get into the office. Uh, the mornings are kind of, for us, uh, generally get up, you know, get your workout in in the morning if that's what you want to do. I'll go in and, and, you know, get a workout in early, uh, go through some film from the day before, uh, check the academic side, you know, try and get onto campus and see our guys, let them see us, you know, 8.30, 9.30 classes, uh, make sure, you know, they know we're around and, and they're getting to class on time. Usually we'll have a, a staff meeting, you know, 10.30 or 11, you know, we'll give everybody a chance to get done what they want to get done, uh, you know, with with games, it's watching a lot of film on the next opponent. Uh, also, usually we'll, we have practice film, so we'll watch practice film and maybe break that stuff down. Hey, coach, here's some defensive stuff you might want to look at from yesterday's practice, or here's some stuff we can show David Duke about his, you know, offensive decision-making. Uh, we, we will meet for, you know, 45 minutes to an hour and a half, somewhere in there, talk about the team, plan practice, uh, usually grab some lunch, and then – Practice is generally 1.30, 2 o'clock, and you're ready to go. So that's a, that's a standard day during the season. Uh, you also got to mix in, you know, the guys who are doing the recruiting, mix in recruiting calls and contacts there. And, um, you know, luckily by, by the time, you know, practice is over, 4.30, 5 o'clock, uh, we'll have training table and you're home for dinner. All right. Uh, and the last question, Bob, I want to talk about the recruits coming in next year. We do have some good returners coming back with David Duke and Nate Watson coming back and also A.J. Reeves, which are probably going to be the three big leaders of the team. Uh, with them coming back, can you talk about the recruits in the season next year in general? 
Yeah, we're excited about it. You know, we're replacing five seniors and five seniors who've won a lot of games and played a lot of minutes, right? All five of them were in our top eight or nine this year. So, uh, but you have to keep recruiting and we've got uh, some talented young kids coming in that we think can help. Uh, and we had two kids who sat out this year. So we're transfers. So Jared Bynum uh, has a chance to be the starting point guard for us. Had a really terrific freshman year at St. Joe's. And Noah Horkler, uh, who came in, who's more of a, a face four, you know, spread five man, a 6'9 kid who can really shoot it uh, from North Florida. So those two guys hopefully can step in and help. Uh, we have two other transfers, Bryson Goodine from Syracuse, who's a 6'3 scorer, and Ed Croswell, who's a 6'9 post player from LaSalle, have both transferred in. Uh, actually, the NCAA still hasn't made a decision on whether or not transfers are going to be eligible to play right away or whether they're going to have to sit out. Uh, and then we've got a guard, Alan Breed, uh, who's a, a Georgia kid, who's a talented uh, combo guard scorer, uh, who is at IMG Academy. And then Jair Davis is more of a combo forward uh, from, from Delaware. So right there, you're looking at six new guys, two of whom were in the program last year and, and four more who are all talented and hopefully we think can help us. Coach Walsh, I know I said last question, just one more because I just thought of this while you were speaking. Uh, <laughs> uh, I just have a question. With the coronavirus going on, how are we, you know, you getting the plays that, you know, are coming in and also the plays that are already in the system that we spoke about, you know, how are they getting gym time? Are they staying on campus? I know a lot of the college has been shut down all across the country. And how are they getting their workouts in with gyms closed? <laughs> How is, how is all this stuff working out for you guys? Zoom. That's how, all right? Everybody's meeting on Zoom. No, it, it's, it's, it, it's a challenging time. The campuses are closed, right? There are no students on campus except for, you know, at Providence. Maybe there's 10, 10 or 15 kids who are international kids who couldn't go home, who needed a place to stay. But the campus is closed. Uh, they're not going to have any students on campus this summer, which we're used to. So... Our guys are home, uh, and honestly, we're meeting once a week, you know, sometimes twice a week via Zoom. Uh, and again, I kind of go back to the culture that you've established. I think our guys are starting to realize now, and, and we've told them, but obviously it takes a little while to, to settle in that, you know, at least until the end of August, we're going to be on our own. So some guys are doing workouts in their backyard. You know, our strength coach is a, is a monster. He sends them jump ropes and bands. Uh, and they have, you know, workouts that they can do. Some guys are able to get to a gym locally, and hopefully with some restrictions being, being raised, uh, you know, other guys will be able to do that. Some guys have, you know, outdoor basketballs, and they're doing, you know, ball handling workouts in their driveway. So you got to figure out the best way uh, to find a way right now. And, and luckily, we have the right culture, and our guys are holding each other accountable. They're talking to each other about, Hey, what are you doing today? I'm going out for a run. You know, even if you just go run four miles, do something to stay in shape so that when we do get back together, uh, we'll be able to get after it. All right, Coach Walsh, thanks so much for your time. This is Coach Bob Walsh, and he is one of the coaches at Providence College. Coach Walsh, good luck next season. We hope to have you on again sometime down the road. Thanks, Fire Breathing. Rob, I appreciate it. Good luck to you.